Hello and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Or as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast where me and my brother John, that's that other guy, answer your questions, give you dubious advice, and bring you all the week's news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. How you doing, John? You know, to be honest, I'm a little bit tired. Sarah's been out of town for a few days, uh, and I've been uh, sort of running around trying to write and record stuff and make good videos and also uh, sleep and take care of my children. And the thing that fell by the wayside was sleeping, especially last night for some reason. I think I, got, I just got too sucked into watching the election returns. We're recording this on a Wednesday after... Uh, so-called Super Tuesday, uh, named that because it's the fifth time that we've supposedly had a Super Tuesday. <laughs> the American primary election system is just astonishingly inefficient and arcane. Uh, and so I stayed up too late. How, how are you? I'm good. I, uh, I, I did not stay up. I was at a concert last night. I did check my phone and it said the thing that you would find out if you would have just waited uh, and that you could not have possibly changed. Uh, so, uh, and I, I, I looked down halfway through and found out all the things. And then I went back and this morning I found out that we have a nominee for, for a Supreme Court justice, which, uh, which, uh, you and know, he's an elderly gentleman. He's he, elderly. Yes, he looks like he's uh, like maybe fifty-six. He is the oldest new justice in forty-four years, or he would be uh, if he were um, to be confirmed, which he won't be. So it's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> and the next really? president will nominate someone far, far, far more liberal than he is. Uh, and that person will become the next Supreme Court justice because, of course, Donald Trump is not going to be elected president. But he is apparently going to be chosen as the Republican Party's nominee, which uh, is that the, is this the first time that we've said Donald Trump on the podcast? Because I'd be really impressed if it was. Oh, God. I feel like it is, and I feel I feel like maybe that's been a little bit of a conscious decision because, oh, goodness gracious, do we not want to live in this world? I don't really want to live in a world where I have to talk about Donald Trump's policy positions as if they are um, serious or, you know, yeah. anything other than, uh, yeah, I don't know, Hank. I am frustrated by the quality of political discourse in the United States, as I have been for a long time. I keep trying to remind myself that this is not in truth, uh, an entirely unprecedented turn of events, you know, like we've had periods like this in American history where um, in extremely polarized times, populist candidates uh, gained lots and lots of traction. Uh, but boy, I'm not encouraged right now. I'm not encouraged by the yeah. the way that we're talking about policy or the way that we're talking uh, about each other. It's 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 poof, not a lot of fun right now to be uh, an American living in the presidential season. It is, however, astonishingly profitable. Uh, the ad rates for both Crash Course, SciShow, uh, Vlog Brothers, everything that we do have gone absolutely through the roof, which should indicate uh, maybe part of the reason why uh, this whole process drags out so for so long and benefits the people who are the most media savvy, which is that uh, this is a huge part of how media companies stay profitable. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, it's very frustrating. I wish I did not profit from it, but I'll tell you what, John. It's only going to keep going up from here. The advertisements haven't even really begun. I know. It's I know. Just, it's, it's like the sp the spending is just at its very beginning, and I, I can, we can already tell the difference. And it is an amazing thing uh, as a content creator, because of course I think that like you know traditional media don't really want that to be a thing that is known, uh, because it's because it's terrifying. Yeah, they seem to be wanting to hide it, but you know nobody watches CNN except when there are election results coming in. And the more dramatic and crazy and shocking and upsetting those election results are, the more likely we are to be watching, and therefore the, the better the ad rates are. But also, just the number of political ads, in uh, because we have very little campaign uh, finance oversight in the United States, the number of the, just the raw number of political ads that people are trying to get out forces ad rates up higher and higher and higher. So that in 2012, they were, you know, the two months before um, 
the election, we were getting, you know, three times as much money per view as we were um, in 2011 or 2013. It is a it's a crazy situation. Yes, correct. Accurate. And uh, let us move on probably, to questions. Prob- from our probably viewers. make a video about that. But no, you have to do a short poem, John. I forgot to do the short poem. I even have a short poem. Hank. Oh, good. This short poem was actually sent to me via Twitter from Julie, who wrote, Have you read There Will Come Soft Rains by Sarah Teasdale on the podcast? If not, I recommend you do. It's about death, if that helps. It does help. It does. There Will Come Soft Rains by Sarah Teasdale. And I guess this is written about or in wartime. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night, and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire. And not one will know of the war. Not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. There Will Come Soft Rains by Sarah Teasdale. A nice poem about the apocalypse. (laughs) All right, John. Uh, We have questions. We have so many questions, and they're good questions, and we should try to do our best to answer them. While also... Okay, I'd like to start with one. Okay. Oh, you've got one ready. This question is from Claire, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I am a 15-year-old Taiwanese female who is currently living in Taiwan. However, I am also a Canadian citizen, but I haven't actually lived in Canada in 11 years. I know I'm Canadian because I have a Canadian passport, but I also feel like I'm less Canadian than someone else who's currently living in Canada. But I'm always quick to identify myself as Canadian whenever people ask me why I speak English so fluently. This makes me feel guilty since I don't have the same amount of exposure to Canadian culture as someone who's lived their, their entire life. And it got me wondering, as someone who has a Canadian passport but hasn't lived in Canada in a while, am I more Canadian than someone who doesn't have a Canadian passport but has lived in Canada longer than I have? I just thought this was a fascinating question, Hank. Uh, and it reminded me of uh, one of my all-time favorite novels, Ulysses, by James Joyce, which I read uh, with my friend Ransom Riggs when uh, I was a junior in college. Uh Ransom went on to write Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, the movie adaptation of which comes out soon. The trailer looks awesome. Um, And in that book, Ulysses, there's a great moment where uh, the book is about this guy, Bloom, who's he's an Irish person, uh, but he's also Jewish. And so he's seen by many Irish people as uh, sort of belonging to two nations, you know, the the Jewish uh, identity and the Irish identity. And it's almost seen as a threat to his Irishness that he's Jewish, and in some ways a threat to his Jewishness that he's Irish. And uh, at one point, somebody in a, in a bar asks him, well, well, what is a nation? And Bloom says, uh, a nation is the same people living in the same place. And then he pauses and says, well, or different places. Because, of course, you know, by then the Irish diaspora was such that most Irish people lived outside of Ireland and the Jewish diaspora had long since been such that almost all Jewish people lived outside of, uh, you know, the traditional uh, Jewish homeland now known as Israel. And the book was written before Israel was a state. And I just find the concept of nationhood and national identity completely fascinating. And all I can say to Claire is... Hold on to that discomfort, explore it, think about it, because it, it's a way into thinking about the identities that you choose, the identities that are thrust upon you, and what you're going to do with them in your life. Mostly I'm fascinated that you could feel guilty about having a nationality. Yeah, I, I, I would never feel that. I, I just have a hard time, like... Well, I think it's more that she feels guilty, that she feels, like, inadequately Canadian. Like, the, the, like you know, saying that, I'm Canadian when you aren't truly. Like, that you don't have that inside, like, the actual reality of Canadianness inside of you. And so saying it is is a kind of lie. Um, but, like, yeah. Right. But what, what, is, what is any of that anyway? Yeah. I, I, right. What does it mean to have Canadianness inside of you? Like, I know that Molson Beer has it. I know that ice hockey has it, uh, <laughs> but I don't know how people have it. Oh, well, I don't know that I've ever had Molson in my life. Here's another question, John. This one's from Megan, who asks, Dear Hank and John, I love the podcast and listen to it as soon as it comes out each week. Thank you, Megan. 
I have moved just recently and am completely overwhelmed by the unpacking processes. How do I prioritize what to unpack first, and how do I keep my one-year-old from negating any progress I might make finding spots for all the things? Any dubious advice would be appreciated. Well, the dubiousest of advice is to put your one-year-old into some kind of pen, uh, which I believe they call a crib, and just lock it in there. Well, not just that, but I mean, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, Megan is is literally surrounded by boxes. <laughs> right. Yes. Just turn upside down one of the boxes and place it over the child. <laughs> one year olds, they're not yeah, very. I mean, capable. if you turn upside down one of the boxes, the kid will have uh, a like a playpen for hours, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, sure. Kids like kids like the boxes. Is what you're telling me? They're like cats. Yeah, they like they love box forts. Mm, boxes. Cool, cool, cool. So how does she prioritize, though, John? Uh, well, first off, I think that moving is just incredibly stressful. So I think just acknowledging that is important. Uh, the way that I unpack boxes when I move is I unpack my books first because it makes me happy. And then I slowly unpack everything else uh, as I need <laughs> it or use it. And then after about a year, I find that there are still a bunch of things that I haven't unpacked. And I throw yeah. those things away. Uh, or you just... If you have a big basement, you just put it down there, uh, which I do. Um, I yeah, I, I think you got to unpack with like first do the things that make you happy. That's important, uh, and do the things that are going to make you comfortable and and let make your life eat livable, like uh, kitchen stuff. And I also think that it's really important. And and often the last thing that gets done is putting stuff up on the walls because that seems like a sort of like you're not actually unpacking, you're decorating at that point, and that's not that's not unpacking. I need to unpack. But I think putting stuff up on the walls is how you make yourself sort of feel like you're at home. And I, I think that that can be an important part of unpacking, uh, even though it doesn't feel like the most productive thing you can be doing. I think that was extremely undubious advice, Hank. It was almost distressingly good. All right. If you say so, uh, I, I very rarely follow it. We only recently got our downstairs walls uh, unpacked upon in, in the last uh, few months after living in our house for about a year. But uh, it is something that I like to do. Um, and, and actually makes me feel like I live in a place. I think that's wonderful. Should we move on to another question? Yeah, sure. All right. This question comes from Stephen, who asks, Dear John and Hank, I noticed earlier this year that the license of Vlogbrothers videos since September of last year were changed from standard YouTube license to Creative Commons Attribution. I'm curious about what led to this choice for Vlogbrothers in particular. So for those of you who don't know, Hank and I are not just world-famous podcast stars. We also make YouTube videos. <laughs> uh... We have a channel, Vlog Brothers, that we've been doing since 2007 and a bunch of other channels. Uh, and Creative Commons Attribution basically says you can do whatever you want with this uh, as long as you attribute it to us. Um, thank you. Yeah, basically. And we made that change, I believe, Hank, correct me if I'm wrong, nine years ago. It's just that YouTube uh, didn't update their uh, settings until recently. Well, uh, kind of. It, the YouTube didn't nine years ago have a thing that let you identify your content as Creative Commons. They introduced that sometime in the last nine years. I don't know when it was, but we noticed it in September. <laughs> uh, and and that I believe that happened uh, uh, after I uh, posted a video in uh, of my Yellowstone trip, and I and then I posted on Hank's channel, uh, and I said, "Here's all the footage from my Yellowstone trip. It's Creative Commons. Anybody can use it." And somebody said, "You don't have to like put that in the beginning. You can just like like click that button in the YouTube license." And I was like, "Oh!" And then I made that the default switch for Vlogbrothers videos. So all Vlogbrothers videos are Creative Commons, uh, though they are not all labeled that way by, uh, on YouTube just because we can't go, there's a lot of clicking necessary to make that happen. Yeah. And uh, and we want that basically because like, who cares? And uh, we love it. We have always loved it when people have done cool things with our content. And uh, and we can't do that for SciShow and Crash Course for, for various funder reasons, but um, are happy to do it with Vlogbrothers because we don't even really know what we're doing uh, still, and it's still just like 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 the connection and, and interaction between the people who uh, uh, you know connect with our content on Vlogbrothers is the most important part of that channel for me. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, copyright law is pretty broken on the internet, obviously, uh, and insofar as we can stay out of people's way uh, and help help them make stuff that's what we want to do uh i even think that copyright law is pretty broken when it comes to books uh as evidenced by the fact that uh, uh you know 
my work will be copywritten until like uh, 95 years after my death or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. I am very uncomfortable with that. And, uh, and, and although I don't expect my books to be read uh, in that distant future, uh, if I find that it's looking like they might be, I definitely will uh, put it in my will that that, uh, that stuff gets released into the uh, commons because I think it's so important for um, for art uh, to be able to work off other art and to be able to respond to other art and to be able to quote liberally, mm-hmm. even to be able to, you know, lift whole passages or uh, rewrite it so it's Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, whatever. I, I uh, you know, John, I, I have to say that you might die at any time. You should probably put that into your will now. Yeah, well, if I died now, uh, thank you for the reminder. Um, if I died now... Um, I would want my work to remain copywritten for some time because it would help, right. you know, my kids with their education and everything. Uh, but Sarah, Sarah is under, Sarah is under instructions. She knows it's all written down. Okay. Uh, you don't have to worry. Everything is fine. Okay. I am going to die. You have a will, don't you? Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh it's, I think it's called, uh, Hank's, Hank's will, uh, it, it's a folder, in fact, and it also contains instructions for what to do with, uh, uh, like, ha- how to uh, access all of my files and such. Mine is called, uh, Have I Suddenly Died? Question mark. And if you log on to my computer <laughs> as a guest, it's the only file that you have access to. <laughs> I love that so much. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's so wonderful. That's oh, um, yeah. So yeah, if you log onto my computer as a guest, there's just one file in the center of the screen that says, "Have I suddenly died?" Oh, you're so prepared. Um, it's actually, but most of it is like Sarah has all of the passwords. Uh, if she has also suddenly died, uh, we all better hope that Rosiana is around. <laughs> <laughs> Never let John, Sarah, and Rosiana on the same airplane. Exactly. No, it's too dangerous. <laughs> too dangerous. All those passwords. Um, yeah. Uh, fascinating. Glad to know that you've got that all uh, taken care of, John. Uh, in in line with that uh, that that line of questioning of of thought, I have a question yeah. that I would like to find. <laughs> Somewhere here it is. Uh, it's from Jessica, who asks, "Dear Hank and John, I don't know why Jane Austen's Mister Darcy is one of the most revered romantic men in literary history. He was a jerk in the beginning of Pride and Prejudice, and that somehow makes his change of heart more endearing. Like, what? Why is that? I know you're both familiar with Pride and Prejudice, so I thought I would ask to you to share some of your thoughts." My husband and I love your podcast. Well, you've come to the right place for a guy who's gonna. Defend William Darcy to his to his dying day. So, uh, do you want to start, John, or should I? Uh, you start. <laughs> I think it's because because uh, he shows that he can change. Not because like not because he can change from a being a bad guy, but to being a good guy. But because he uh, has a worldview, and when he gets new data, he doesn't change. Uh, his worldview, he recognizes that he should change in light of his worldview and the data that he has. The The pride in Pride and Prejudice is Darcy's, but the prejudice is Lizzie's. And, uh, and she has all of these opinions of him, but she also has incomplete data. So he's being a jerk for a number of different reasons, and some of them are like, some of them are, are bad reasons and some of them are good reasons. Uh, but, a, but a lot of those reasons are not known. They are hidden and uh, and and when they come to light, both his reasons, and which which hel- helps Darcy or Lizzie overcome her prejudice, and uh, and the sort of like you know how how the world is functioning outside of that, uh, that helps Darcy overcome his pride, uh, is is a process of change and of like listening to other people and having a good strong worldview that you believe in, that turns out to be filled with thoughtfulness and kindness, but you couldn't share all of the information and you didn't have all the information because the world is complicated. Um, and and overcoming that 
uh, shows that two different people with different upbringings uh, actually can have very similar worldviews if those worldviews are about thoughtfulness and kindness. And that's a wonderful thing. And I think it's really important because I hear a lot of guys particularly saying that uh, Lizzie doesn't fall in love with Darcy. She falls in love with his house. Uh, and I don't like that's just not true. Like if you read the book, that's not what it's about. Like she like they fall in love with each other after considering each other's thoughts and words. That's what happens. It's not just about what they look like. It's not just about how much money he has. And I think it's a uh, you know, like uh, uh, his rude behavior in the beginning turns out to have had uh, a lot of motiv motivations that couldn't be shared and uh, and for good reason. And when when those things come to light, uh, you know, everybody realizes that they were kind of in the wrong and then are able to come to a, a, a place of agreement and, and beyond agreement, you know, love and marriage and presumably babies. I knew, uh, I knew you were going to answer that question well, Hank. Uh, Pride and Prejudice truly is your Irish nationalism. Um, <laughs> we have another question here uh, from Claire. Very interesting question. Uh, particularly in this historical moment. Dear John and Hank, I'm a huge supporter of bipartisanship or multi-partisanship as I live in Canada and we have a multi-party political system. Uh, quick side note, Claire, um, please let us into Canada. Well, you know, John, I've been looking into it and it's not that hard, uh, but apparently so have a lot of people. And additionally, I don't actually want to move to Canada. I want to be, I want to, I want to do this America thing. We can make it happen. I love the United States so much. I love its chain restaurants. I love its broken, dysfunctional medical system that I know how to navigate. I love, like, I am so American, so incurably American. When we moved to uh, the Netherlands for a few months thinking that we might make it a permanent move, I immediately realized that I can't. I can't live in Holland because I am too American, but I might be able to live in Canada anyway. Uh, I'm sorry, that isn't Claire's question. Um, I think our repulsion from bipartisanship is what's slowly destroying Western politics. However, when I meet with someone who has different political views from mine, I am immediately turned off from them. How do I reconcile myself with my own hypocrisy and move toward accepting a more politically diverse group of people in my life? Oh, Claire, I thought you were going to answer that question. I have no idea. <laughs> I so I'm reading a book right now about this actually, uh, which is fascinating. It's by it's called the Reun Reunited States of America, and it is by Mark Gerzon, and it has uh, it just recently came out like like this month, and it has a lot of uh, high quality reviews on Amazon, but it does have one star one one star review on Amazon, and I would like to read you that one star review, John. Okay, that one star review says, Doctor Phil. <laughs> It is just the words doctor and Phil followed by a question mark. And I do not have any idea what's going on, but uh, it's the number one new release in government. Uh, can I tell you my, my, have I ever told you about my favorite one star review for the fault in our stars? Oh, sure. Go ahead. T tell me. That. In addition to being a world famous podcaster and YouTuber, I am also <laughs> a uh, part time novelist and I wrote a book called the fault in our stars and it has a lot of one star reviews on Amazon, all of them gold in their own way. Mm -hmm. Um, like, I mean, it's just, it's, it's hard to, to say what's my favorite one because <laughs> I've read all of them so many, um, so many times, you know, uh, but my favorite is from a user named Catherine, presumably not your wife, uh, who says, uh, uh, item was not received as described. <laughs> and and I don't know if she's talking about my my novel or the shipping process or what but like I I can't tell you how many things in life I feel are described by the sentence item was not received as it was described. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think the United States of States of America may in fact be one of those items or at least Congress. Um, but the, I, the, I have not received the Congress that was described to me. I have received a Congress, but not the Congress that I was told about in seventh grade civics. Uh, yeah. um, so the so this book has been a fascinating read, and it is it is about it is you know it is about that process. How do you come to uh, talk to other people 
and uh, and present yourself in a way that is not immediately dehumanizing uh, other people or immediately demonizing, vilifying them, thinking that they're either ignorant of something or evil or, um, you know, like like de- devol- dis- dissolving into an argument or a fight uh, every time you have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you. And and I we have become very sort of tribalistic in the way that we we think about uh, our parties. One of the points that was made in the opening chapter of the book is that uh, a majority of Americans don't want their children to marry into the other, marry someone of the other political party. And that's like, wow. Yeah. Ugh. That's, I mean, like, I get it. Like, yeah. And I think about myself and I'm like, kind of like, yeah, 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 maybe. But like the fact that we're there um, feels really, really wrong. It feels like there is something like, like we're driving along in a car that that has had the oil light on for a while and we we like for decades and we need to take this thing in for service um but it is a very uh, i'm only like a quarter of the way through but so far and it's a short book uh so far it's really great and i i suggest it the reunited states of america to to sort of like think about this very thing because i don't think there's an easy answer but i think that 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 answering that question is important for every single person right now yeah i mean we've just got to find a way to talk about about things better i mean one of the been thinking a lot about uh the support that donald trump has which you know is a minority of american voters significant but but it's a significant minority of american voters and uh, and just trying to understand that, and I think I understand some of it. I certainly understand why why, why lots of people feel that they have been uh, left out of the so-called economic growth that the U.S. has experienced since uh, since 1990, or even really since 1980, um, because a lot of that growth hasn't been particularly inclusive, and so it doesn't uh, so it so it isn't experienced as growth by the vast majority of people, which kind of means that it isn't growth. Um, and I, I and I certainly get why people feel um, uh, like the country has changed in ways that they aren't comfortable with, or or like uh, we've been, you know, we've sort of been left behind in some way. But I, I I find it really difficult to have discussions about policy statements like we should not allow Muslim immigration into the United States mm-hmm. because that's incorrect right and it's and it's based on this very circular reasoning of we will be safer if we don't allow muslim immigration into the united states which i've seen no evidence for and it's not it's it's kind of not a provable data point no. uh followed by the circular reasoning of and we must do everything that we can to be safer uh without considering you know what like what do we mean when we talk about safe uh, what do we mean when we talk about, yeah, what do we mean when we talk about safety in the U.S. when... And what do you mean when you when you say everything? If you're talking about we must do everything we can to make ourselves safer, no one, no one believes right, that. Right, right. Um, but... But yeah, no one actually I, I, believes that, right? So then, so that, but then you get into you get into these very circular logic loops, and you don't get to have discussions about like a like a really interesting topic, which is you know should the uh, income tax rate for income over five hundred thousand dollars be thirty nine percent, forty two percent, thirty seven percent? Those are things that we yeah. can talk about uh, and disagree about without. Uh, it feeling like our lives are right. on the line. And I think part of the problem here is that, you know, to, to try to get elected, to try to get attention, politicians and frankly, the media have made it sound like our lives are on the line for who gets elected president. And when the stakes feel that high, it becomes very, very difficult to talk about policy with someone because what you're really talking about is, wow, if the top marginal uh, income tax rate is 42 percent, everyone I love is going to die. And that's a like well, it's it's you know, it's that, I, and it's we're not going to be able to have a conversation. It's also then. that we've tied our ideology so very tightly to our identity that we feel when our ideology is being threatened, that our our personhood is being threatened. And when I when I listen to right. the conversation, what I, what I'm trying to do now is hear not uh, not whether or not this sounds objectionable to me or sounds awful to me, or I disagree with the policy statement. But to think about whether the statement is designed to create division, and that's what a statement like "we should we should not allow all Muslims to 
we should we should ban Muslim immigration to America. That statement is not a policy statement. That is a, a statement designed to create division. And all politicians do this. Right. And so I'm trying to listen as hard as I can to statements that are designed to create division on all sides. And and like hear who and like right now the person who is best at not doing this is of course Barack Obama, who doesn't need to care about getting elected. Um, and so like it it's sort of remarkable to hear. But like, you know, you can definitely hear in everybody and all every single candidate statements that are designed to create division. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And let's not and, and being turned off by yeah. those first and then by policies second is not an easy thing to do. I have like so there's this uh, there's this thing in in the, the liberal world, uh, which is like if Donald Trump is the nominee, that's probably a good thing for the progressive agenda because he probably won't get elected and he will probably get a lot of people out to the polls, a lot of liberals to the polls. Uh, and and we, we might get, you know, more control, uh, more power to do what we want to enforce our our agenda. And that's like, that's a good thing, right? Because that's what we want to do is we believe that this agenda will make the world better. But I like, I think that that view of this situation is like, kind of terrifying because what you're saying is I don't care how torn up this country gets as long as I get to enforce my agenda. Um, and like, you know, like I can see that point of view, but like a hundred percent, you have to say like, do I care more about America not getting torn up and like dragged, like the steering wheel of this country being dragged in every direction uh, by people who, ju who just want this control? Or do I care about like the, the nation feeling like a nation and healing itself and not, not getting like having these wedges driven deeper and deeper between people and uh, who do not actually differ that much ideologically, uh, but who have been convinced have been convinced that we do. Yeah, no, I think that's a hugely important point that in a lot of cases, there's a lot of uh, ideological uh, crossover. There's also a lot of policy uh, opinion crossover. It's really the the way that we approach it. And just so we're not lambasting only the Republican Party, I have to say that, you know, in, in the Democratic Party, uh, there is a very similar us them yeah. uh, dichotomy created, which is the phrase the billionaire class mm -hmm. uh, that you hear over and over and over again, which is some vague uh, other uh, these, you know, 50 or 100 families in the United States who supposedly sort of control the future of the U.S. Uh, let me submit that, like, if this were an actual oligarchy, those 50 to 100 families, the vast majority of whom are Republicans, would have found a way to get literally anyone on earth other than Donald Trump to be the Republican nominee. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think that they think it's in their best interest to have Donald Trump be the Republican nominee, uh, the billionaire class. Uh, but I think any time any time that we're trying to, you know, uh, create this sort of vague, villainous other, um, even if it is a sort of somewhat villainous uh, group <laughs> like billionaires. Um, uh, I, I think we need to be very, very cautious because uh, the truth, I think, turns out to be a lot more complicated than... Says a guy who's really good friends with a billionaire. I am not good friends with a billionaire. I do not know any billionaire intimately um i am good friends <laughs> it seems like you and bill gates just hang out all the time uh, bill gates and i do not hang out a ton uh however i do <laughs> i do suspect uh, that my having met bill gates a few times has humanized billionaires for me in a way that perhaps most people have not experienced <laughs> 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 I, and I and I realize too that I'm you know obviously I'm coming at that whole conversation from an extremely privileged perspective and um and and probably a somewhat defensive one yeah uh, but the the truth is and I think the the big underlying uh, truth that is a cross party uh, problem that needs to be acknowledged is that. Uh, the growth in the United States, the economic growth in the United States since, you know, about 1980 has been very, very unevenly distributed and that that is a problem. It's not going to be solved by like, quote unquote, negotiating with China. It's not going to be solved by like emulating Putin. It's not going to be solved by, uh, you know, somehow like bringing down the billionaires because it's not <laughs> that easy. Like the truth is that it's a really complex problem that's 
born of a globalization that has been in many ways beneficial not just to the world, but also to the United States. And not in every way, but in some ways. And acknowledging that complexity and trying to start from there, like how are we going to get better jobs in the United States? And how are we going to find ways for wages to go up, uh, which they haven't really done in a long time? That's a big, interesting question. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we're going to solve that problem by you know, villainizing the Chinese or lionizing Putin or villainizing billionaires. I just don't think that's going to solve the problem. Like if we raise taxes, income taxes on billionaires to 95%, it would represent like, I looked, I, I figured this out the other day, it would represent like uh, something like half a percent of uh, of our income tax yeah. going up. Like it, there just aren't that many billionaires. Yeah. Yeah. There, there aren't. And, and they have a lot of, they have a lot of the wealth, but they don't have that much of the income. Uh, which is a, th- that's a yeah, and they don't. They have a lot of the wealth, but even they don't even have a lot of the wealth relative to the overall wealth. Like yeah. they do, but yeah, yeah, they don't. Yeah, it's complicated. It's complicated. We should make a video. Sorry, you about got it. Hank. Hank and I off on a rant in which we never actually answered your question, Claire. I, so I well, apologize. I suggested a book at least, which will I think help. Uh, but I do, I do uh, hope that this has like I. I do. As we get closer to the election, I'm, we're going to do our best to make this uh, podcast open to people and interesting to people who are not Americans. And I apologize for the amount that we're going to be talking about America, but we're not going to do it as much as we uh, as as we would be inclined to. Uh, not that we, I don't know. When I was in Jordan, lots and lots of people asked me about Trump. Oh, that's awful. That's terrifying. That is terrifying. I'm terrified and want to run away. Yep. They asked me if he was going to be president. They shouldn't know. God, can't we just can't we just like keep this one under wraps and be like, ah, that didn't happen. All right. Can we move on to another question? Uh, yes, we can. I have one from Adam, John, who asks, dear Hank and John, I have an urgent life or death question. Why do we say yes, please? And no, thank you. Why don't we say yes, thank you? And no, please. Oh, because. Uh, well, Adam, when I say yes, I'm generally saying, please give me that thing. Yes. I will take that thing, please. No, I guess I could say thank you, too. Actually, now the more that I think about it, the stupider it is. Adam is right. We've been doing this wrong all along. No, 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 because you can't say no, please. Because no, please is uh, what you say when you're being tortured in a movie. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's when, like, uh, when like Putin shows up in his bear costume and he's got, like... Uh, <laughs> He's got like a car battery or something, and he's about to he's shock doing you. Judo. You're like, no, yeah, he's please. Got a car battery. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You can't say no, please, Adam. You can say no, thank you, and yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, I think it's because of the, the what the what those words mean as the reason that we say them the way we do. Uh, I have a question, Hank, that I I want to get to before we get to the news from Mars and the news from the dark lightless cave that is AFC Wimbledon. All right. This question is from Aisha, who writes, Dear John and Hank, I'm a Christian, and it can be rough. I had to leave the main Nerdfighter Facebook group because the hate of religion is so strong there, although I love some of the other Nerdfighter groups. I'm not an evangelist. I am not evangelistic, but I get so much backlash once people find out that I'm a Christian. I know that I'm not being persecuted, but I don't feel like defending my belief system every time I speak to someone who doesn't share my faith. But I also don't feel like I should have to hide something that makes me who I am. How do I handle this negativity? I think that's a really interesting question, Aisha. The internet uh, is sort of, on the whole, pretty strongly anti-religion in my experience. Like, at least that is my feeling about it. Um, I am also a Christian. I handle it mainly uh, by talking about my religious faith, but not trying to defend it. Mm -hmm. Um, And when people ask me to defend it, I generally just say that I'm not really that interested in defending it. Like, it just doesn't interest me much. Because I don't think that it's going to be a productive or interesting conversation. Yeah, that's a. I think that's really good advice. And it's not, like, as a person who is not religious, I, like, it is so, it has become more and more perplexing to me the way that non-religious people some non-religious people approach religion as a source of as like this monolithic source of badness or like that that there's some that there's some really fun thing out there that is the that is the attempt to argue and and put on the defensive a religious person and make them have to defend their faith and i just like it just it's so tired 
and uninteresting to me. <laughs> and I, I mean, it feels tired to us because, uh, you know, we were right. part of that first wave of internet discourse in the late 90s yeah. or early 90s that was doing the exact same thing. Yeah, Hank. no, absolutely. But, I, I literally... Uh, but it does feel tired to me The other day now. I found, I had printed out and kept in a binder some stuff from like my old, old IAG email address. And one of them was like a literal email debate I had with another, I assume, 12-year-old. Uh, about the real the, the existence of of God, and I, you know, I like read, and I I thought that was important enough for me to save, I guess, and uh, and like I, you know, it's if if it's about helping yourself, to, helping you define who you are and what you believe and how you interact with the world, then then like yes, but if it's about you trying to feel superior to other people and uh, and to like have this this view that like certain kinds of people are responsible for all of the evil in the world, then, uh, then you are like, there's, there's an issue. There's an issue and it's not them. It's you. Yeah. I remember the like, uh, awakening moment for me was I was talking to someone on the internet. I think I was probably in college. Uh, so I don't have the excuse of being 12 like you did. I was talking to someone on the internet and, uh, and they were pointing out all of these things in the Bible that uh, that contradict themselves, especially things in the Gospels. There's four different uh, Gospels that tell four different accounts about the life of Jesus, and uh, they often uh, at least appear to me and to most people to to speak contradictorily um, about about the life of Jesus. At times, he has three different last words, for instance, in the in the four Gospels. Um, and someone was pointing this out to me. And I was like, yeah, no, yeah, I, I get that. And they were like, well, that means that you can't believe in God. And I was like, and yet I still do. So I, I think I might have just disproved your point. <laughs> like, like at, at, at some point, it, it, you know, like it, it, it ceases to be, um, it ceases to be productive or to me, at least it ceases to be like a, a fertile ground for uh, exploration uh, and it becomes, you know, personal and complicated and nuanced in ways that you don't really necessarily talk about well with strangers. And I think accepting that for me was the turning point. Uh, I, I have one more question that I want to ask before we get to the news from Mars. John, uh, are you ready for that? Yes. All right, this one's from Lizzie, who asks, Dear Hank and John, Today a couple of my roommates and I were talking about nuclear weapons and how terrifying they are and how many exist in the world. I was wondering if there were a way for we could even ever hypothetically get rid of all the nuclear weapons that we currently have oh, there's a without, way. you know, totally, totally destroying the planet, uh, uh, like shooting them into the sun or etc. But yo, no. Yes. Oh, wait, that was my way. Indeed. Yes. There are easy ways to get rid of nuclear weapons and we do it all the time. Uh, it, it, mostly we do it through nuclear uh, power plants. Really? Yeah. Well, that's nice. We take the fuel from nuclear weapons and we and we put it into nuclear power plants. And uh, that when we decommission nuclear weapons, this works for most nuclear fuel. We are able to actually take that, put it in the power plant, and make power with oh, it. See, the, so that's wonderful. And that's where that's where a lot that's where a lot of the current fuel of nuclear power plants comes from. And we're actually running out of that fuel, uh, and which is a problem. <laughs> so we we have to like get more of it again. Oh, I have an idea. What? We could decommission more nuclear weapons. That's a, I like it. I like it. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I will also say, John, that uh, our nuclear power plants are also a source for uh, for for nuclear weapons. Uh, and and indeed, when we were designing our nuclear power plants, we made it specifically so that some of the byproducts of the nuclear power plants could be used in nuclear weapons. And if we had not had that alternate goal in mind, we probably would have ended up with a better system for generating nuclear power that would have been uh, safer because it wouldn't have produced all of these byproducts that could potentially be used in weapons. So that's a bummer. Wow. So uh, I guess that knife cuts both ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a bummer. But um, instead of a knife, it's a nuke. Yeah, it's... it's I, I guess... I guess I, I, can we use the phrase from now on? I guess that nuclear weapon cuts both ways. <laughs> <laughs> that really seems like a double-edged H-bomb. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by double-edged H-bombs. <laughs> double-edged H-bombs, sometimes used for fuel. Sometimes not so much. Uh, today's podcast is also brought to you by the complexities of Mr. Darcy. Uh, handsome, rich, 
And additionally, uh, with a complex, thoughtful worldview that uh, makes uh, people who take the time to get to know him really, really fall in love. And today's podcast is brought to you by Vladimir Putin wearing a bear suit, holding a car battery. (laughs) Vladimir Putin wearing a bear suit, holding a car battery. Please, please, no. No, please. (laughs) And this podcast is finally brought to you by placing your one-year-old into a cardboard box so you can get some freaking work done. <laughs> placing your one-year-old in a cardboard box so you can get some freaking work done. Save it, everybody, time since the year 10,000 BCE. I don't think they had cardboard. Uh, we should also thank <laughs> our Patreon uh, subscribers who actually bring uh, Dear Hank and John to you. If you want to get a monthly uh, live stream, which is inevitably disastrous, Hank spent this week's <laughs> Uh, talking almost exclusively about his struggles to get an appointment with his gastroenterologist. If you want to, uh, if you want to, if you want that kind of hot, hot content, uh, check out the uh, Dear Hank and John Patreon, patreon.com slash Dear Hank and John. Uh, you can become uh, a patron of our show and uh, get a live stream, but mostly you just help out with uh, Claudia and Nick uh, and their work on the yeah. podcast. Also, you can choose between AFC Wimbledon and Mars, which you want to support. It won't actually matter because the money goes to the same place, but... Uh, right now, AFC Wimbledon is losing by a lot, and it makes me sad. Well, you know, maybe we, maybe we should get to the Mars news then. All right, what's the news from Mars, Hank? Uh, the first component of the ExoMars mission, a joint project between the European Space Agency and Roscosmos, launched last week and is now on its way to Mars, and it will arrive there in about seven months, eight months-ish. Uh, There are two components to this first mission. There's a lander, which is mostly just designed to test a landing system, uh, but it's going to do a little bit of experiments, but mostly it's just testing the landing. And the other is an orbiter, which uh, has the main job of detecting trace chemicals in the atmosphere, um, because the goal of this two-part ExoMars mission is to actually, like, actually their biological goals, which we've been really uh, sort of wary about at NASA, but the ESA and Roscosmos is just going after it. Uh, so the the orbiter is going to be looking for m- to de- to detect methane in the Martian atmosphere, which we've detected before, and we're a little bit confused about where it's coming from. Though it here on Earth is often generated by biological processes, so we th- are, are very interested in where that methane is coming from. Uh, the orbiter will be able to figure that out and then take pictures of areas where the methane concentrations seem to be originating from and then use that to find a good landing site for the next component of the ExoMars mission, which will launch in 2018, which is a rover that will land around where that methane is being produced, theoretically, uh, and uh, and do science and explore that area to see where what's going on with these, uh, this mysterious methane. That is... That is a giant spider. That is a giant... Wow, that is a big spider. On Mars? Wow. No. I was not looking at Mars. That's on my wall. I don't know what to do. It's so big. Oh, take a picture of it and put it on the Dear Hank and John Patreon. It's so big. Oh, my... God. It's, I, I can't see it anymore. It's like all the way across the room, and it's going really fast, and now I can't see it. Take a picture of it. Take a picture of it for our Patreon, which you can... By okay. the way, you can access that for free. You can see Hank's spider pictures for free. I I just Hank, we need to do more content outside the podcast. So Hank, do you remember that I, I on my way to Jordan I stopped by AFC Wimbledon, met all of the players, had a wonderful time, they lost to Oxford two uh, one. I, I you can you can still hear me, but the podcast can't. Oh, apparently the podcast can't hear Hank because he has he has run away from his microphone uh, because he's afraid of a spider. Is that correct, Hank? That is correct. Well, can you hurry back? I can't. I can't pod without you. You told me I have to take a picture of it. Well, I didn't think that it would involve getting out of your seat to take a picture of it. It's real big. Can I deliver the news from AFC Wimbledon? It is important. Yeah. Yes, you may. Hank, you will recall that I went to visit AFC Wimbledon uh, on my way to Jordan with Rosiana, and we saw them lose to Oxford two-one. Mm-hmm. Sadly, unfortunately. I seem to have cursed them while I was there. I met all of the players, and I accidentally put a hex on them. Since then, things have gone from okay to terrible to yet worse than terrible to unbelievably bad. Uh, Lost to Oxford 2-1. Tied, lead leading Northampton 1-1. That was a great result, actually. Nil-nil draw against Accrington Stanley. Then, loss to Bristol Rovers. And then, a oh. loss to Morecambe. Or oh. Morecambe. Oh. 
they're more hey, camba to give you a sense of what it's like to lose to more cam they're like a mascot is a shrimp an actual shrimp they are known as the shrimping team they come from the shrimping country in the far northeast of england possibly I northwest mean, i have exceptionally bad ability to distinguish between east and west you don't know how good a shrimp would be at soccer maybe there's like a super long history of shrimp soccer maybe uh but given the size of the ball and the size of shrimps i'm a little dubious anyway we lost to morcam it was devastating uh i don't i don't want to uh i don't want to make it seem worse than it is but they're 18th in league 2 and we are now down to i believe ninth, uh possibly 10th which is just it's very bad we're ninth. We're ninth on 53 points, and we need to get up into the top seven spots in order to have a shot at the playoffs. There are now just 10 games remaining in AFC Wimbledon season, so uh, they would have to go on an incredible run to make the playoffs. That is the update. I wish it were better news, but instead it is like walking all the way into a cave, so deep down into that cave that you turn around and you find that there is light neither behind you nor in front of you. It's called cave darkness. There isn't a single lumen of light. That's how I feel right now. So I I look at the table and you're in ninth, though, and you have to be in seventh, right? So you're only two out. Yeah, it's just the way the results have been going, though, Hank. It's like, uh, are you familiar with the concept of momentum? Yeah, but I do not think that it applies to phenomenon such as, such as this. I, I think uh, if you... You know, past performance, as as they say, is no guarantee of future success or future failure. You, it's it's all it's all, all right. just just all just dice. It's all just dice being thrown on that football pitch, John. And you just got to keep throwing those dice. Well, it's not all just it's not it's all just it's dice. It's not all just, it's dice, all just or, dice. Or Northampton would would win fewer games. <laughs> but yeah, I I think uh, I think I guess I guess the reason that I feel so hopeless i mean look it's always like it's great news afc wimbledon staying up in league two is great news that's the main goal for every season but like the reason i feel such despair is that i let myself feel such hope Uh, by the time of the oxford game by the time that game kicked off i was properly dreaming of league one football i was I, i was imagining it and that's 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 that was a big mistake I, uh, yeah. Well, you know, you, it would have just been that one season anyway, as you said. Uh, and That's true, but what a season. What we would have been able to travel the country, visiting the likes of Swindon Town. Ooh, Swindon Town. I know. I know. It would have been Ooh. great, but it ain't going to happen. Or maybe it will, but it looks less likely than it did a few weeks ago. So that's the news from both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. Hank, what did we learn today? We learned that John has a lot of complicated thoughts about nationalism and Ulysses, which is a book. <laughs> yes, I guess we learned that. Uh, we also learned that both Hank and John are clearly distressed about the quality of political discourse in the United States so much that it kind of derailed the podcast. We learned that you should unpack your boxes in order of what stuff you need, and then if you don't need it, just don't unpack it, and it'll just you'll just have like four forks <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, that's uh, yeah. and just a bunch of boxes. Yeah. Our advice is so good. How, hey, hey, Megan, how come you got four forks in your house? Oh, John and Hank told me to. <laughs> <laughs> they told me to stop at four at unpacking four forks. I um, haven't needed also, one. That's it? that's also why my uh, one-year-old child is in this here box. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we learned that if uh, Vladimir Putin, wearing a bear suit, approaches you with a car battery, you should say not. No, thank you, but rather, <laughs> no, please. Yeah, it's important linguistic advice uh, from here at Dear Hank and John. Uh, thank you for podcasting with me, John, and thank you to all the people for pod listening, uh, which I think is what that's called. I believe that is the technical term. Uh, our podcast is edited by Nicholas Jenkins. Our hardworking, amazing intern is Claudia Morales. Thanks also to Rosiana Hulse Rojas for helps with the questions. Uh, our theme music is from Gunnarola. You can email us at hankandjohn at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at Hank Green at John Green or on Snapchat, I'm Hank GRE. And as they say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to, to be, be awesome. awesome.